morning. <clears throat> this week we're finishing up the Jesus on Serious Discipleship series, and uh, we're glad you're here with us this morning. <clears throat> so we all follow someone, right? When we're children, we follow our parents for that, that period of time when, when our parents are the authority in everything. And then, then there's that time that comes when the kids come home from school and they say, but no, Dad, my teacher said. And then you're no longer the authority in their lives. And it's, it's kind of heartbreaking for a parent when that first happens um, because all of a sudden your kids don't trust you anymore. But no, Dad, my teacher says. Of course, then we grow up, and as teenagers, we have lots of authorities in our lives. Maybe it's our teachers, our parents, our peers. Sometimes we're following an employer, but we're all following someone. Of course, if you ask most teenagers, they're going to tell you that everybody's bossing them around, right? It's interesting about being in the crowd and being a part of the crowd, because sometimes we feel like, you get involved in a crowd and, and you change your opinion because you want to just go with the flow and you want to go with that crowd. But there's actually been scientific studies done that show we actually get pleasure from changing our opinion to match the crowd that we're in. Which means we're not only changing our mind for the moment, we are actually changing our opinion to go along with the crowd that we're hanging out with. It's pretty crazy that, that the crowd really controls who we are, and, and how we act. <clears throat> of course, then there's the rebels who say, well, I'm not going to go with the crowd. I'm going to be different. But really, they're just choosing a different crowd because they're not alone in being rebels. They're just choosing a different crowd. And we all choose different crowds. Picking the right crowd can be pretty important. You know, in high school, you have the option to, to, to be a jock or a stoner or a loner. Right? The Marine Corps had the option, the drugs got a little more serious. I didn't pick that crowd, but, but the crowd I picked wasn't necessarily the best one. And that's kind of where most of us probably are, right? Well, I'm not as bad as those guys, right? I'm mo- making mostly good choices. See, the crowd that you choose to follow really can determine where we are. And some of us are content because, you know, look at that crowd. They're far worse than we are. Maybe that's why we like to watch the news and see all the bad things that are happening in the world because, well, I'm not as bad as that, right? I've got it going pretty well. What's interesting is there's some pretty great crowd examples in Scripture. And I'm only going to share a few, but trust me, there's a bunch. From the New Te- Old Testament, very beginning, to, uh, to New Testament. But our goal is talking about discipleship. But I just want you to see what happens when you follow the crowd. In the days of Noah, the crowd perished. And only eight survived. After the flood, the crowd decided they wanted to build a tower to be like God. They wanted to build a city and not spread out and do the things that God had ordered, asked them to do. In the days of Abraham, the crowd wanted to worship idols, even Abraham's own family. In the days of Moses, the crowd wanted to worship a golden calf because Moses was gone for three days and they were lost. Jesus tells us that the majority, the crowd is going to hell. And it was the crowd that stood around and said, crucify him. It was the crowd that sent Jesus to the cross. So, but there's this interesting thing about following the crowd and following. Because I believe that in following, we're also set to be leaders. So we're not just followers. All of us are leaders. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Because being a follower requires us to be a leader. And it's important, not just who you are following, but how you are leading. We've had some great lessons on discipleship and what it means to follow Jesus. And today we're going to look at Jesus' words. And I want to look at a little different perspective on discipleship than we've talked about so far. Um, Inside your bulletin, there's a a green insert. Um, You can follow along. Uh, There's a couple trick questions on here. So... uh, not all the blanks are on the slides, so you'll have to listen maybe a little more. They, they're pretty obvious, so it shouldn't be too hard. But um, for those of you that like writing and, and uh, taking notes, go ahead and pull out that outline. <clears throat> so have you thought about who you are leading? Have you thought about where you're taking them? 
Where are you leading them? As a parent, it's easy to get caught up in, in just keeping our kids alive, right? I mean, when you start out and you have this baby and, okay, I got to make sure I feed it. I got to make sure I change the diaper. Uh, I got to make sure it gets enough sleep. And, and we get caught up in just, just making the decisions that, that keep the baby alive. And, and it kind of goes on. And, and then we worry about the decisions our kids are making just today. And so we're worried about whether they're a good kid or a bad kid because we really want to have good kids. Um, and yet, have you spent much time thinking about if your children are following you, where are you leading them? See, it's pretty eye-opening as a parent to hear kids yell something, and maybe it's even a cuss word, and you turn around, what? What did you say? Where did you learn? Oh. Hmm. And you realize at that moment that they learned it from you. It was something that you have done, and they saw you do it. That's where we're going to start with Jesus' words in Luke. <clears throat> Luke's uh, one of the Gospels. It's, it's, uh, there are four Gospels in the Bible, and they tell the story of Jesus. And, and Luke is telling one of those stories in, in the Bible. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 6, starting at verse 39. Then Jesus gave the following illustration. Can one blind person lead another? Won't they both fall into the ditch? Sounds obvious, right? Students are not greater than their teacher, but the student is fully trained, will become like the teacher. Now, of course, no one would follow a blind teacher, right? Well, not on purpose. But Jesus is reminding us that we need to follow a competent teacher. We need to know that the teacher that we are following is taking us where we want to go. And he goes on to remind us that the student will become like the teacher. Now, it's one thing to say that we're disciples of Jesus, But that really isn't the whole story because none of us in this room have really met Jesus. All of us are disciples of a disciple of a disciple of Jesus. All of us learn the things we learned about Jesus from somebody else, from a disciple of Jesus. The student who is fully trained will become like his teacher, just like a child will become like their parent. I grew a lot in my relationship with Jesus when I spent a year discipling with Gene, life on life we did together. We met once a week and, and I learned a lot. We read a lot of authors. We spent time memorizing scripture, praying for each other. But mostly I learned from Gene's example. I learned from the way he applied scripture to his life. I learned how he was dealing with his struggles and, and the sin in his life and the things that were happening in his marriage and with his children. I learned what it meant to be in a relationship with God and, and in a relationship with others but I really grew more in the next year when I started discipling others. And I've gone through a variety of discipling tracks and most recently leading a heart transformation group. But each of those tracks, when I've taken the opportunity to lead somebody else, I actually learn more than I did when I was a disciple myself. And the truth is, I believe that we can't be students of Jesus alone. You can't study God's word and and sit at home and apply it to your life and have it change you. It only happens in relationships. It only happens in authentic discipleship relationships. Now, our life groups is a place where we start relationships here at Valley View. You can do life together. You can deal with many things together. You help each other. A lot of ministry occurs in the context of a life group. And life-on-life discipleship is one step deeper. It's another group where, like a heart transformation group or or Celebrate Recovery Step Study or other life-on-life discipleship where men are working together with men and women are together with women and you're dealing with that garbage in your life, those things, those temptations, those things that you can't even share with your spouse, that you can't even share with your friends at work, doing life together. You need to be following a competent teacher that can show you the right way to follow Jesus. And at the same time, you need to become a competent teacher so that you can disciple others. Continuing in Luke, look at verse 41. Why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? Now, see, we talk about that verse a lot in saying, don't judge each other. Just, just don't judge each other. No judging's allowed, right? That's kind of how our culture seeps into our Christianity. But that's not what this verse is saying. This verse is about discipleship. 
Let's take a look a little deeper. He's talking about one friend helping another friend deal with the junk, the sin in their lives. Don't judge your friend until you've taken care of the problems in your own life. Look at verse 42. How can you think of saying, friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye. When you can't see past the log in your own eye, hypocrite. And here's the good part. First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. See, first get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to help your friend. See, this verse is telling us not to judge our friend, but it is telling us to take care of what's happening in our own life. Who are we following and how are we following? But then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. See, if you're dealing with the stuff in your life, you're going to be open when you come to your friend in Life on Life Discipleship and you're going to say, you know what? I'm really struggling with this. Help me set some boundaries in this. And you're authentic and you're honest and you're open. And your friend and you are going to walk through this together. And then you can, your friend can say, you know what? I'm dealing with something similar. I'm dealing with that too. So we're supposed to help our friends. We're supposed to deal with the speck in our friend's eye. But we're supposed to do it with humility. So it's talking about making sure that you're following before you are leading. If you're being obedient to Christ, then you can help your friend be obedient to Christ. Jesus is telling this story in the midst of talking about discipleship. Jesus is talking about discipleship and our relationships with each other. Discipleship is about following and leading. We cannot follow without also leading. It's a two-direction path. It's how Jesus intended it. That was God's plan. We grow in our relationships as we pass it on to others who are following us. It's interesting, nearly 100 people in the church took our discipleship survey over the last uh, five weeks, and we want to thank you for that. Um, Some interesting results I just want to share. The four lowest areas, the four areas that had about 40%, below 40, right at 40%, um, engaging in a life group, sharing my faith with others, Discipling others and serving others. All four of those areas where we're missing the mark in discipleship as a body from from the example or, or sample that we've taken so far have to do with relationships. Enough of us are not getting involved in authentic relationships. I hope that some of you are using the results of your survey to to decide where you want to grow in your relationship with Jesus, because that's part of the purpose. Uh, one part was so that we as a staff and the elders would know where our, where our church family is. But the other part is that we really want you to have the opportunity to know this is an area where I need to grow, to recognize that. And today we're launching our life groups for God's at War and our upcoming sermon series. And those life groups are a great place to start getting involved in relationships. You need to be in a group that you can serve other people that you can hang out with other believers. You need to choose a crowd that you can not only participate in, but, but eventually learn to lead in. And the survey showed that many of you aren't sharing your faith with others. That's about relationships. You have to love somebody, spend time with them, get involved in their lives, be, be friends with them, be praying for them, uh, be serving them and loving them the way that Jesus would long before you get the chance to share your faith with them. But yet Satan convinces us that we just have to memorize scripture. We just have to stand on a street corner and tell people, you know, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to die. You're going to go to hell. But that's not what we want to do is sharing our faith. Sharing our faith is about relationships. We want to get involved in people's lives and we want to authentically love them into the kingdom. Show them that Jesus is a better way. The only way. Jesus is the truth. We're responsible for each other's growth. And we have the opportunity to empower each other and help each other be better disciples. But that only happens in meaningful relationships where you can talk about the sin and the struggles in your life. You can grow closer to God and you should have those relationships where you're being led and where you're leading others. By the way, if you haven't taken the survey yet, it's still available on our website. Really encourage you to do that. Um, One of the things that leads me to is that Jesus had this conversation with Peter after the resurrection and before he went up into heaven. Um, This is in the book of John. Bible says in the book of John, um, sometimes that's called the gospel because the gospel is the good news or or the story of Jesus. Um, So gospel of John, John 21, verse 14. This is the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he'd been raised from the dead. After breakfast, Simon Peter 
Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and you went where you wanted to go. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. Peter turned around and saw behind him the disciple Jesus loved. That's another name for John. The one who had leaned over to Jesus during supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? And Peter asked Jesus, what about him, Lord? And Jesus replied, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. See, Jesus is telling Peter what he will suffer. And of course, Peter's concerned about it being fair, right? Because if I'm going to suffer, well, well, then my buddy should suffer too, right? So what about John back there? You know, the one you love, Jesus? What about him? Is he going to suffer too? Because we want everything to be the same. But it isn't always going to be the same. Peter and John faced different situations after Christ left. They both suffered. Their suffering was different. And yet, in fact, suffering was pretty common for the early believers in the church. <clears throat> Those first disciples suffered a lot. Jesus was reminding Peter of the cost, and he repeated his request. No matter what cost Peter was going to pay, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Who are you following? Feed my sheep. How are you leading? Pass it on to my sheep. Now we're going to jump back to Luke. Jesus again describes the two paths, the the path of the world, those who choose to love him and follow him or not. Verse 43, a good tree can't produce bad fruit. A bad tree can't produce good fruit. A tree is identified by its fruit. Figs are never gathered from thorn bushes and grapes are never picked from bramble bushes. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. An evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. See, Jesus is emphasizing the importance of who you are following. Jesus talks about being identified by our fruit. A good person produces good fruit. What you say flows from what is in your heart. So what's the ultimate fruit of the Christian life? The command in the Great Commission, the last instruction that Jesus gave to his disciples, to make disciples is the fruit of a Christian life. To produce good fruit, we must be good followers. It's important that we're identified as followers by our fruit. So listen again to the command Jesus gave. We call it the Great Commission. It's in the Bible, in the book of Matthew. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. See, that's the discipleship plan. Jesus gives it to us. Pretty simple. Jesus is the ultimate leader. Now go and make disciples. Baptize them. Teach them to obey all the commands I have given you. And guess what? Jesus says, I am with you always. See, in this plan, Jesus is the leader. We must all be following him. And then there are the new disciples who we need to teach to follow Jesus, teaching them to obey all the commands. Pass it on. Pass it on. The reminder in Luke is Jesus is telling the disciples, guess what? You can't teach others if you're not following well. You need to be producing good fruit. To produce good fruit, you need to be a good follower. And of course, Jesus finishes his story in Luke with another explanation of the two paths. 
following Jesus or following the world. Verse 46. So why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. It's like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against the house, it stands firm because it is well built. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds his house without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. These final words in Jesus' sermon call upon his hearers to put his words into action. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? See, Jesus knows that there's a lot of self-professed followers. There's, There's believers who simply believe in Jesus, but then they don't do anything about it. They know the language of discipleship. They know the talk, but they don't walk the walk. Jesus says the result of being a disciple isn't that you talk the talk or that you use the right words or you know the right things. It's that you do the right things. You're concerned about relationships. The story or parable of two houses needs little explanation. If you build your house on the strong foundation, the foundation of Jesus' words, then the storm of life, no matter what life throws at you, you're prepared. You will persevere. And if you don't obey, your life will come crashing down. Jesus knows that many are readily agree with his words of love, with his mercy. They even applaud how he treats other people. But Jesus has no interest in their talk if it's not accompanied by action. See, that's what Jesus wants. He doesn't just want us to to be believers, people who believe in Jesus. He wants us to be disciples, fully surrendered followers. To be a follower means that we're obeying his words, that we're putting his words into action. Love God and love your neighbor. It's about how we deal with relationships. Jesus is asking, do you love me? Do you love me? Then feed my sheep. You will show more love to Jesus by passing on the love that he's given to you, by passing on what you've learned to others. It's not enough to study God's word, to pray every day, to worship. Those are all pieces of discipleship that help us love God and to keep that log out of our own eye. But the next step is to feed his sheep. We have an obligation as disciples to share the love of Christ with others, to be people of action who are concerned about others and want to give them a relationship with Jesus. We're called to help others take the same steps that we've taken. Now, I'm not saying that you need to go to Bible college to be a competent teacher, because guess what? That's not how discipleship works. Discipleship works that you're literally just one step ahead of your brother. But you know what? If you think about... footsteps in the sand and and you've taken one step well guess what you can show your brother where he can put his next foot because he's got one step behind you to follow that's all it is that's what it means so so those of you that are sitting back saying i'm working so hard just to figure out how to be a follower myself well you know whatever you have figured out that's enough to tell your friend and pass it on because every one of us is one step all we have to think about is helping our friend be one step closer to Jesus. That should be our goal. One step closer to Jesus. Those of us that have been further down the path have a few more steps that we can show our friends. But every one of us who has taken at least one step towards Jesus can show our friends how to take one step towards Jesus. We're all called to help others take the same steps that we've taken, to lead them on the trail to Jesus. And it's pretty simple. Inside your Bulletin, there's a connection card. On the back of the connection card, three next steps that you can take today, that you can make a commitment to today. First of all, I will love Jesus and obey his commands. That means I'm going to follow well. And of course, second one is I will follow well and seek to lead others, to show others the path that I've taken. The last one's a pretty serious commitment, but it says I want to be mentored in a discipleship relationship. Right now, we have two discipleship tracks. We're working on two other tracks. So about halfway through this year, we'll probably have four life-on-life discipleship tracks where you meet in a group of four or five or six uh, men together, women together, and you're dealing with life and just doing life-on-life for six to eight months together, growing in your relationship with Jesus. But part of that commitment of doing life-on-life discipleship 
is that I'm going to take this myself, and then next year I'm going to pass it on, and I'll lead a group and teach somebody else. And imagine how good our life-on-life discipleship can become if we're multiplying it every year. Every group that starts out with two becomes four. Four becomes eight. We can have a lot of groups doing life-on-life discipleship and really helping people deal with the stuff in their lives. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you've created a system for your kingdom to grow by using us to build it. Lord, help us to be the people that you've called us to be. Help us to learn the things that you've called us to learn, to follow you, to love you. And Lord, help us to feed the sheep and pass it on to others. We just thank you for all that you do in our lives. We thank you for this church that helps us grow closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.